Hello, I'm Amy Caples, Assistant Professor of Media Studies and Production at Temple University. Welcome to the second installment of this unique partnership between Temple University's School of Pharmacy and the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, or ISMP. We have a lot of topics surrounding medication error prevention to get to, so let's jump right in. We'll begin this episode with a topic that remains a persistent medication safety problem, one that involves a key component of patient information, the patient's weight. Measuring an accurate patient weight is essential in calculating the appropriate dose of numerous medications. Neonatal and pediatric medication dosages are primarily weight-based. When a patient's weight is not available or is inaccurate, the prescribed dose may be significantly different from the appropriate patient dose, possibly leading to preventable medication error and even significant patient harm. With us to expand on the issues surrounding the significance of accurate patient weights is Alan Veda, pharmacist and executive vice president at ISMP. Alan, what are the most common safety issues associated with patient weights? Well, one of the major issues that we see is actually obtaining an accurate weight on patients. And that may sound as simple, but Oftentimes patients may come in through the emergency department, they may be trauma patients, and you can't get a weight on them. But other times, healthcare professionals feel that they're good at estimating a weight. And there's been many studies done over the years that actually show that healthcare professionals are not very good at estimating weights. And patients themselves, if they haven't been weighed in a while, are not good at estimating their weight. Sometimes it could be a vanity issue that they don't want to state actually how much they weigh. And their caregivers also may not know the weight. So this is one of those important things that we always recommend get an accurate weight when patients come in to any healthcare setting. Alan, what steps can organizations take to avoid errors involving patient weight? Well, one thing is that they need to have a setup to have scales available in order to get the weight. So this is something that, yes, if you go in the physician's office, there's usually scales there. But oftentimes in the emergency department, like when I mentioned about critical patients coming in, there's also bed scales. And not many hospitals may have enough bed scales or patients may come in in a wheelchair. And there's also scales for that. So one of the things we say is to make sure that you have the scales available. And even if you don't have them now, it's something that you could plan for in the capital budget. The other thing too, is that you need to have the scales measure in metric weight. And that's an important aspect of this whole issue is that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't use the metric system for weight. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, all the medications that we use, their doses are in metric. We talk about micrograms or milligrams or grams. We don't talk about ounces of a medication. Mm -hmm. And the prescriber's information also is available in metric units. So those, uh, the drugs are dosed as milligram per kilogram or gram per kilogram. So everything that we do from a medication standpoint is based on the metric system, yet patients oftentimes are weighed in pounds. And then you have to convert it. And oftentimes those conversions are not done accurately. And it's about a two-fold difference. So that if you overestimate or underestimate, you could either be giving two-fold more medication or to full less of the medication. So that's the other aspect is to not only getting that weight, but also the metric system, using the metric system to actually record and document that weight. It is hard to believe something as simple as documenting a patient's weight can have such a significant safety impact. Are there other organizations aware of and in favor of using an actual metric weight? Yes. 
aside from ISMP, which we've been advocating this for years, there's also the Emergency Nurses Association. There's the Academy of uh, Emergency Physicians. There's also the Academy of Pediatrics. The Academy of Pediatrics have done a very good job with this, and they actually use the metric weight. They have conversion charts for patients so that everyone likes to know, especially with their child, how much in the metric doesn't make a lot of sense to them, but they have conversion charts for the parents. But they're doing an excellent job with this. Thank you, Alan Veda, for that update. Next up, we focus on a safety issue involving confusion between two concentrations of the same drug. Unfortunately, practitioners, including pharmacists and anesthesiologists, have sometimes confused two concentrations of the same drug, leading to a very serious error, an overdose of a paralyzing agent used for patients undergoing surgery. The issue is with cisatracurium, which is available in both a 2 mg per milliliter and 10 mg per milliliter concentration. The brand name is Nimbex. The 2 mg per milliliter concentration is used during intubation of the patient. The 10 mg per milliliter concentration is used to compound continuous infusions. I'd like to welcome back Mike Cohen, the president of ISMP, to walk us through the recommendations. Mike, what is ISMP advising practitioners to do in this situation? Yeah, it's a potentially serious situation. We actually had a report. Uh, as you know, we operate the National Medication Error Reporting Program. We actually had a report from an anesthesiologist who actually gave the stronger concentration in error, and that's a five-fold overdose that the patient received. So it's uh, potentially serious, and fortunately, um, this patient was intubated, was on a, a respirator. It, it is given to patients uh, that uh, are, you know, under undergoing uh, artificial respiration of some type, um, and uh, you know, it, it could have been quite serious if the patient wasn't intubated. Um, what we recommend, obviously, is uh, instead of leaving it up to the anesthesiologist to prepare the injections, uh, having pharmacy prepare them instead is uh, one thing that can be done. Using barcoding is another. Uh, this error also took place in the pharmacy, though, because they dispensed the wrong amount in a vial. And uh, then the error was uh, duplicated by the anesthesiologist. Uh, so one of the things uh, that can be done in the pharmacy is to store these separately. And I think that's very important. And wherever they are stored, I think uh, it requires uh, special labeling, like a warning mm -hmm. about uh, the high concentration. A lot of people aren't familiar with the two different concentrations. Uh, the uh, lower concentration is used as a loading dose, and the higher concentration is used to prepare infusions when surgery is going to go on for quite some time. Uh, so. Uh, those are the things you can do. I think uh, preparing in the pharmacy the infusion mm -hmm. and dispensing it that way and uh, using barcoding are probably the most important things that can be done. Mike, thank you for these very important recommendations. Mm -hmm. Mike will stick around to discuss our final topic of this newsletter, the potential dangers of patient-controlled analgesia by proxy. Patient-controlled analgesia, or PCA, has been widely used in hospitals for more than 20 years. But there's one form of it that ISMP has long warned against. That's PCA by proxy. PCA by proxy means it isn't the patient that is controlling the amount of opioid he or she is receiving, but rather someone else, like a family member or an aide. With PCA, the great benefit is the patient can give himself or herself a dose of strong narcotic by simply pushing a button on his or her pump or on an attached cord. Prescribed limits are set, so a maximum safe amount can't be bypassed. But a more important built-in safety mechanism is patients will become sedated or fall asleep with adequate relief, so they don't feel a need to continue to push the button. But when someone else does this for the patient, are they helping to relieve their loved one's pain? or simply causing more problems. 
Mike Cohen is back with me now. Mike, complicated issue here. What does ISMP recommend when dealing with PCA by proxy? You know, this is a potentially dangerous situation. Uh, by proxy means it's not the patient controlling patient-controlled analgesia. And obviously, that term patient-controlled analgesia means it's supposed to be the patient. So it's someone else, sometimes a family member. Uh, we we uh, had a situation recently where a uh, hospital employee, a safety companion, uh, who meant well, obviously, uh, was with uh, an elderly individual um, who was in pain and using uh, patient-controlled analgesia. Uh, but this employee was actually pushing the button for the patient. So well-meaning, you know, trying to keep the patient from having a lot of pain, kept pushing the button, and unfortunately uh, pushed it to the extent that uh, the patient who we thought was sleeping actually uh, was, was sleeping, but then uh, later on uh, uh, became stuporous and uh, unfortunately stopped breathing from the opioid overdose. Now this is something that we've had happen actually uh, several times and uh, we've actually been to uh, locations where this has happened. I remember one tragic event where uh, a mother was lying in bed with her daughter and uh, pushing the button for her daughter. So a terrible situation, uh, her daughter also uh, was a fatal event. Mm -hmm. So what do we recommend? Well, obviously uh, training of anyone who's near a patient with patient-controlled analgesia. Uh, it is supposed to be the patient that pushes the button. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. So uh, besides the training, what we like to do is have patients actually come in, especially for elective surgery, meet with the anesthesiologist or the pharmacist, the caregivers as well, if they have a family member, for example, that might be with them, and learn about the patient-controlled analgesia and understand that they really should, no one should be pushing the button for the patient. Also, uh, it might help to put some note, you know, right on the cord that the patient uses to push the button for patient use only. Mm -hmm. So that can be helpful. That's another thing that we recommend. Mike, we thank you for your expertise as always. And that will do it for this edition of the ISMP Video Newsletter. As always, you can look forward to receiving your regular ISMP newsletter every other week. Meanwhile, you can find all of the information we discussed here and any of the latest medication safety news by visiting ismp.org. I'm Amy Caples. We'll see you next time.